And I knew it would be a good story. What lights me up? How do I need to actually get better? I became a better leader as a result of that. And I think that required... Mohan Sivaloganathan is a keynote speaker, coach, and proud father, affectionately known as the Batman of Social Impact. By day, he's led national organizations to drive transformational change in education, civic engagement, and social justice. By night, he's a hip-hop artist whose music amplifies the voices of communities and inspires action. Formerly the CEO of Our Turn, he now dedicates his energy to promoting harmonious leadership, a framework he developed to redefine leadership by balancing well-being with high performance. If I get 1% better, then I will end up somewhere. You just need to get in the field. Mm -hmm. Like You need to get in the field, you need to get in the arena. That's the only way you're really going to find out. I don't think ideas are the problem. Because how far are you going to push that idea if you're on the brink of burnout? It's surprising to me that maybe you have burnout as well. This idea of harmonious leadership. Like what would it look like to break false choices that people There's this reframing that we need to do to see rest as a necessary mm. gift. If you can share like your typical Tuesday, how does it look like? Usually the first thing I'm doing is... In his recent TED Talk, The Breakthrough Power of Young Leaders, Mohan shared his unwavering belief in the potential of youth to reshape our world for the better. His own journey, as the son of Sri Lankan immigrants, is a testament to the power of resilience, humility, and courage in the face of adversity. Mohan's commitment to his work is more than just professional, it's deeply personal. Two-thirds of Gen Z and millennials are expecting their companies to prioritize. I want to be the one who my five-year-old self and my 85-year-old self will be both proud. Yes, try to find your allies. A younger version of mine, I wish I could know that as well. What <laughs> would you want your son, your 22-year-old son, to say about you oh. at the year 2040? I'm so excited today. Yeah, Because I think I'm Mohan. I'm going to pronounce it. Siva Loganathan. Mohan, Mohan Siva Logan nothing today. Yes. It's for my Escape 9 to 5 podcast. I'm so lucky that you say yes to this podcast. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, because this podcast, I mainly wanted to share the stories with people like leaders like yourself and people who have broken out of their traditional mm -hmm. society expected uh, 9 to 5 life. And your bio is as diverse as I can, as I can ever imagine. You're the Batman of the social impacts and yeah. you're also hip hop rapper mm -hmm. um, and then you've started your career in Procter Gamble and then at the end you have uh, succeeded a non-profit called Arjun and then now you're on another idea. I found you on this TED talk where you talked about how young leaders can help shaping the world. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting and funny, your TED talk. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so welcome, welcome to the Much show. Appreciate it. Much yeah. appreciated. Good to connect. I'm excited for Yeah, thank you. Today. Thank you so much for replying me. Um, if there's anything you want to add about your uh, bio and anything our business to you. Uh, you know, I think um, I tend to have more of a problem with talking too much versus too little, and so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna resist that urge to add on. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, so let's get on to it. Um, yeah. The first segment I usually have is two tooth and a lie yeah. with the escape nine to five twist. If yeah. you can share a three. Two truths and lie, escape nine to five version. Mm -hmm. All right. I've been a part of organizational restructuring five times. Yes. I've been working remotely, but I'm really looking forward to getting back to a traditional office setting. Mm -hmm. And during a job interview once, my pants ripped. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> I think the third one is two details would be not true. Okay. I would go with the first one because number mm -hmm. is easy to manipulate. Oh, got it. Um, it's not true. Once in an interview, my pants did rip. Yes, that is very specific, and yes, that did happen. <laughs> Fortunately, nobody heard it or saw it, but that did happen. Um, I had to actually leave during the break time in the interview. So it was like a full day interview. I left during the break time. Fortunately, I had like a long coat with me, oh. covered myself up, ran out to I think like H and M and got some new pants. Um, I have been a part of organizational restructuring five times. Oh, um, yeah. you're not looking forward to yeah. going back to a traditional I'm not looking forward to going back to a traditional office setting. Oh, that's, that's yeah. good to know. Because yeah. some people are looking forward to going I think, back. I think there's some elements that, that I miss. I mean, certainly just being around people yeah. more often, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, I had a meeting with a friend at Google recently, and yeah. like, their cafeteria is incredible. I was like, oh, this would be nice. Yeah. Um, but maybe two days a week. 
I maybe think. two or three days yeah, a week. Not, a week. Not, more, not more than that. I appreciate my flexibility. Yeah, but nowadays yeah. even Amazon is asking people to go by five days. Five days? Yeah. yeah. No, that's not for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not for me. It's no, same for me. I, I cherish my flexibility. Yeah, same for me. I, I work so much better in the cafe. Mm. I love talking. Then there's going to be people else like sitting next to me in the cafe. I will end up talking to them mm-hmm. as well. When was the interview that you that your that was for the role I was just in, uh, of the CEO of our turn. So that was about uh, how long ago now? Like five, six years ago? Five, oh, six years ago? Yeah, that must yeah. be. You must be like panicking at the time. Yeah, I, I mean, it was just like okay, like that happened. Very quickly, get into problem solving mode. Yes. Like that's where that's where my mind went yes. as quickly yeah. as possible. One thing and I, I knew it would be a good story. Exactly. <laughs> I knew that would be a good story. Especially if I got the job, right? Unfortunately, I got the job and I actually did share that story with my team and our community when we announced our rebrand like a few uh, months later. Okay. And I was just kind of talking about like this need to just always be agile to know that like we're in an ever-changing landscape. And I said, well, here's an example of how I've had to be agile, like mm-hmm. when literally my pants wrote. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, wow. Well, thanks so much for sharing. <laughs> I, so now we can dive into our podcast. I yeah. usually start by why then. So yeah. I will ask, like, you are you have so many different interests. And I learned that on your TED Talk, you start your career because you are ENTJ, of the commander oh, yeah. type of yeah. <laughs> personality. Yeah. And then um, if, if you can share a little bit of that with us, like how long you stay there and what pivoted you to actually uh, change from a traditional corporate, everyone wants to work their environment mm-hmm. and to a non-profit. Sure, sure. Well, uh, my parents are, are Sri Lankan immigrants um, and I talked a little bit about their journey um, in, in my TED talk. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think the immigrant experience, is, it's interesting, particularly immigrants and my parents who came to the country with nothing because when they came, it was all about, um, you know, just pure possibility and hustle and sacrifice and ambition. And they didn't know where things were going to take them. But they just had to go all out and they were able to create this incredible platform for me and for my sisters. Mm-hmm. Now, they didn't want me to go through the same experience. Right? Parents rarely want their kids to go through the same experience. No. <laughs> and particularly South Asian immigrants, it's yeah. like, all right, you need to find a path to stability. Yes. That doesn't mean that you need to put a ceiling on what you could go and do and achieve, but you need to find a path to stability. And usually for South Asian immigrants, that means like you're going into engineering or medicine or business or law. Uh, for me, I love math and science, and mm-hmm. so it was engineering. Like, yeah. that was what I majored in in school. Then I went to a major corporation, I went to Procter & Gamble, and I was doing many of the things that I'm technically supposed to do. It's like I was checking a lot of boxes, but um, I just wasn't satisfied with what I was doing. Um, I had so many experiences in my life where I gained greater exposure to, um, to inequity, to the suppression of voice and identity. There were times where I felt like I experienced it myself. There were many times where I was just studying it and observing it. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I wasn't doing enough in the work that I was doing. Now it was still it was still fulfilling in many ways. You know, I learned a lot. You know, I started volunteering for our corporate social responsibility efforts and you know, driving like our employee volunteering campaigns and philanthropic efforts um, locally at that site. But I was like, all right, that stuff, like that's what I want to do all the time. Like yes. this is the stuff that really gets me energized and it gets me excited. Yeah. And so it wasn't just like about like this big societal consideration, ultimately like, oh, like you've got inequity in education mm-hmm. and economics and climate crisis. It was like, what lights me up? Like what is gonna have me energized to get to work on Monday morning? Yeah. Like what is gonna be able to really help me to like amplify the capabilities that I have and it was getting into the space for social impact. And so like I had this crossroads moment. I could stay with PNG. I had this incredible opportunity on the table to go and do external relations with someone who I really admired and trusted with Tide, uh, or to go to Teach for America uh, and to get into this fight for education justice and specifically by recruiting folks to come and teach, uh, to channel their talents and capabilities towards teaching. And it was something that I, I could really connect with because I was trying to yeah. like, redirect my own talents and capabilities. And it was like, all right, like how can I play this role and hopefully catalyzing other folks to do the same. And so that change I made about 16 years ago mm-hmm. and, uh, and haven't turned back. Um, That's great. Yeah. Yeah, because I think a lot of people, especially I'm Asian, where there's only three like banker, lawyer, doctor that I can choose mm-hmm. from. Um, I don't think a lot of my friends, they will make a sudden switch in a way that some of the people I interview on this podcast did, which is why I always ask people, is there a pivotal moment or is a gradual transition? Mm-hmm. And you also, 
thanks for sharing your vulnerable story on the test stage that you're actually putting on a performance improvement team. If you can share a little bit of your moment or the journey that you took from there as well. Like, yeah, it, you know, it, it was tough. Uh, you know, that happened at a time where I knew that I wasn't fitting in. Um, I wasn't feeling fulfilled. Like, I wanted to be successful and I, and I, I felt like I was doing the right things. Granted, I was 22. Like, do you really know at that point, especially like for me, I think 22 year olds today are in a very different place. Uh, but it was really hard to receive that message. Uh, and I remember that night um, driving back home and it was a snowstorm. And so it was a really slow journey coming back and like I'm just there in the car feeling alone, feeling isolated, like, you know, like, am I going to be able to do this? Like my whole life had led to this point where I knew I was going to be successful, but here I am in the complete opposite place. And that was really hard. Uh, and I remember calling my dad. Mm -hmm. and you know telling him about this situation and he knew that like I wasn't particularly happy uh, yeah. in my work and my dad was someone who, who was very ambitious very successful and like you know it could have very easily reflexively been like all right like you just need to push through like just figure it out you need to push through uh, but you know he kind of took it in and like had this real compassion in him and this compassion in his voice and he said uh, you know I think you're going to win Oh, wow. Uh, and I'll hold that forever. Like it was, it was him not disregarding the situation, mm -hmm. um, not just glossing over it in some shape or form, but just seeing me and my vulnerability, the, the challenge I was experiencing at that time and like, being in my corner, like fully having my back. And that just like created this sort of like release in my mind and body. Yeah. Like I was able to put down some of the pressure, these boulders I felt like I was carrying. Yeah. And then get focused on, all right, now what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. Like, how do I need to actually get better? Like, there's all this personal stuff that's really charged up in me. Uh, and that's normal, that's human. Yeah. And now, like, how do, I, how do I use that? Like, how do I use what I know are my strengths to be able to turn the corner? And so I was able to just sort of, like, get into the space of just greater focus and intention and to have the courage to be able to not just come back, but to have tough conversations with people to understand, all right, like how can I better serve them? How can I better work with them? Um, you know, like how do I need to show up? How do I need to communicate? How do I need to collaborate and build bridges? And I became a better leader. Absolutely. Like as, as a result of that. Yeah. Um, and I think that required that affirmation and support from my dad. Yeah, because somebody uh, trusts you. Someone who, yeah, exactly. Where there's that, that deep trust that's there, um, that belief, like building that safety within myself. Uh, and then also recognizing, like this is something I, I think about a lot, that, you know, there's like that, that old notion that if what doesn't kill you makes you strong. Right? Yes, yes. And I think that for me, it's kind of like a yes and. Like I think it's yes and what doesn't kill you and you learn from, yes. like that makes you stronger. Yes, yes. Um, and, and like, so that's something that I've really like cherished now throughout the course of my life in my career is that, yeah, like there are so many tough, harrowing moments that we navigate through and there's a gift somewhere in there. There is a gift. Can you find that gift and then use that as this fuel going forward to, to just get 1% better every day? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think 1% better every day is also another thing called a growth mindset. I mm -hmm. listened to your other podcast. You also mentioned that mm -hmm. it's one of those mindsets that you want to look into when you're hiring people. Myself, I read this book called Mindset. So then the doctor, I don't remember, the lady who wrote that book, she elaborated this growth mindset and fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. And ever since the beginning of this year, I started to try to work on something on my own. The more I cherish that I can actually embody that growth mindset because mm -hmm. every day, like you said, if I get 1% better, then I will end up somewhere given that if my direction is correct. Mm -hmm. so, so after your, you have that phone call that a snowy day, did you still stay a little bit longer in part and Gamble? I did. I did. You know, I was still in that role for another year and a half uh -huh. uh, and then I stepped into another role at P&G for another two years after that. Oh, okay. And then yeah. you quit. Um, and then I moved on. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it usually. I think that's good because then mm -hmm. you also have built enough career capital. Mm -hmm. Last week was the New York Climate Award as we speak is actually um, yeah. the second. So I bumped into a student, she quit her job, uh, she's like 22. Mm -hmm. And 
she's just like, oh, I'm trying to figure out what I really want to do, but I'm not sure. Mm. Um, and she said, I quit the AI operations program manager or something like that kind of role because I don't feel fulfilled. Mm. Um, but being here, I'm not also not confident enough to know whether I've made the right decision. Mm. But if I look at her, she's 22, she graduated from Harvard. Mm. I was like, how many people can graduate from Harvard? Sure. And, but then even for her, she, what, what kind of advice you would give to people like her just based on these kind of profile? Because they mm. do know as a matter of fact, they're 22 year old today, yep. that they don't really fully enjoy the work. Mm. But after they make the decision, they still have some like a lot of self-doubt. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that self-doubt, you know, can come from so many different places. Yeah. And oftentimes it's coming external, mm -hmm. right? It, it's coming from something you might have heard from somebody, something you might have read, this idea that you're supposed to present in a certain way, but knowing that maybe you present differently. And I think the first thing to recognize is that all of that external stuff, like that's based off of somebody else's opinion of the world. And a lot of times that opinion has been formed by some antiquated, deeply entrenched thinking that people in power put into place. Mm -hmm. Like they made this determination yeah. that here's how things are supposed to be and then force that on other people. And then every, I think particularly people of color wind up having to chase after that ideology over and over again. Yeah. So I think we need to free ourselves from, from those shackles. Um, and I think like that that first step is like really leaning into like what are your unique strengths? Mm -hmm. like, what are your unique capabilities? Like to identify that, to plant that flag for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I work with folks through like a coaching con um, context or through workshops, that's one of the things I really try to do is like, I'm not going to tell you who you are as a leader. Mm -hmm. I want to help you to determine who you are as a leader. Yes, uh, yes. And to like, and to own that, have that be a compass for yourself. I think the second thing is that I think almost irrespective of our age, 22 or myself being 42, you just need to get in the field. Mm -hmm. Like you need to get in the field, you need to get in the arena. That's the only way you're really gonna find out like, you know, what are those things where, you, where like what are those areas where you shine? Um, how are you differentiated? What's for you or not for you? So like when I made that transition from the corporate space to nonprofit, I did a bunch of volunteering. Like mm -hmm. I mentioned the volunteering I did with the PNG. Um, I did volunteering even like out in the community. I did pro bono work. Like I was just getting out there as much as I yes. can. Yes. Because I was just learning. I was learning, I was growing, I was building my resume. Uh, and even now, like in this space now where it's been like it's been several months since I transitioned from a CEO role, I'm just getting in the field and I'm experimenting. Like I'm trying a lot of different things and it's giving me insight. Like, all right, this thing, like maybe not quite for me. Um, this thing, ooh, like I want to learn more. Like I want to go, I want to build that a little bit more. So I think like that, that curiosity and that desire to just do, just get out there and just do, I think that could really help. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think also sometimes it's about people in their 20s, like my cousin, he's 25, he's doing his master in NYU. It's about like the way that they can actually focus on day to day and observe themselves to understand what kind of activities or topics that actually make them energized, mm -hmm. which in current day and age, people's attention span is just so shallow. It maybe it's more difficult to do. Mm -hmm. But I do want to take on the notion that you say that nowadays the 22 year old is much different because you work with so many young leaders. Like yeah. what kind of what kind of stories you can you if you can share with us like, yeah. about your work in our tournament? And oh yeah, I, I mean, I think about for instance, um, there was a marketing campaign that we were working on um, this was like right as the pandemic was like really kind of taking off and spreading and during that time if you remember there was also black lives matter yeah. we had a big presidential election this is all 2020 so there's a lot that was yeah. going on yeah. and there was a marketing campaign that we were going to launch so the idea was that we wanted to make sure amidst all of this that's happening let's not regress to the old normal let's create a new normal and have students out of the forefront of them so that all made sense. Everybody was connected with that. Now for me, as someone who had been working professionally for a long time, I, I held marketing responsibilities in my career. Like I felt like I had a good sense of how yeah. we needed to bring this to life. Like what is it gonna take to get people's attention, to get them activated around this campaign? But we started running with a certain strategy around our messaging that um, our student base was actually really uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, they felt like there were certain messages there and certain approaches that we're actually perpetuating inequity. We're perpetuating some traumas. Uh, and I just kept like, like pushing, like pushing and pushing. 
and like making some incremental adjustments here and there, but still kind of like holding my ground. And then finally got to this boiling point yeah. where we had to have a full staff meeting and with our community of students and students just let us know. Here's how we're feeling. We're disappointed. We're disenchanted. We feel like we're not living our values as an organization. Mm-hmm. And it was really hard. Like it was really hard. It was really heavy. Um, you know, there was like some stubbornness in me. I was like, oh, but I think we're supposed to do this. Yeah, now yeah, I feel yeah. like you're putting this on, on my show. I was taking it like very yeah. personally as if, yeah. like, you know, you're putting it on me. Now I have to be the one who has to solve it. And all, again, all these things, like the personal baggage just started running through my mind. Mm-hmm. But then I started realizing like, wait, like there, there is something here. Like this is not just about, I need to drag people along. So let me just follow them. But like, what are they really saying? Like, mm-hmm. And, and as I paid more and more attention to that, I realized, hold on, like I've been boxed in, in yeah. my thinking. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm trying to push something forward that I believe has worked for the past 10, 20 years, but we're in a different day now. Mm-hmm. We're in a different day, we're in a different age, we're in a different audience, different messengers who need to be at the forefront of it. And they're gonna know better than me. Like they're the audience, I'm not the audience. And the thing is, even if I was, again, like I've been colonized. <laughs> like so much of my thinking has been colonized. <laughs> yeah. And so I just appreciate that young people had the courage to put that in front of me Mm -hmm. um, and our leadership team to challenge us, but also to do it with love. Mm -hmm. Um, Because they also could have just been like, all right, forget this, I'm walking out, or we're canceling you, like you need to be fired and that's it. And like, you know, like that happens, right? But they said like, you know what, like we have deep love for this organization, for our values, for what we can be and should be. Now let's figure this out together. And, And we did. Like we actually, we developed a much stronger campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a campaign that wound up getting recognition from national organizations, from hundreds of students across the country, like really laid the groundwork for the type of organization that we would be for years to come. Um, So it, again, like that gift, it wound up emerging even, even in this moment where like, it felt like we were in the fire and it it was feeling like crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, We discovered something really beautiful. Yeah, I think it also shows that you as the CEO, was it the story about our turn, I guess? Yeah. Um, you are the CEO as someone who's also being in a leadership position, but also mm-hmm. being open-minded to take in mm-hmm. um, different opinions, especially mm-hmm. when you're facing this market. There are students and you're trying to do something for the students. Mm-hmm. It's better, like you said, to listen to people who are the audience. Yeah. Is there any advice you would give to yourself back then Mm. Like quickly, just do a mindset shift instead of waiting for a longer period of time. What would you say to yourself? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that you know, starting from this place of like, you know, who are you working with, and like, what will get us all ignited, and being willing to listen to that first and hear that first, um, versus that as an outcome, and me believing me along with other people. Like this wasn't my only my campaign, but me and other people feeling like, oh, we know the thing that's gonna get. Um, folks to that place of inspiration um, because again like you know we're talking about like, the example of the 22 year old like they're going to know best yes. like, what's going to get them excited what's going to feel true and what's going to feel authentic and yeah like that might slow things down mm-hmm. sure um, but it also creates more collective commitment mm-hmm. it creates more collective inspiration and ultimately you'll wind up moving faster because what wind up happening well it would completely slow things down because we had to stop the prior campaign. Like yeah. We had to completely redesign the prior campaign, which we'd already invested time and resources into. So I think that that upfront commitment with people and to be able to co-create mm-hmm. uh, is absolutely the thing I would tell that version of myself. Yeah. Now, fortunately, I think I want to get, take that lesson and then you know really leaning into that power of co-creation. I think for the for the rest of my time. Yeah. Uh, you know, the organization and, and just have a lot of pride in what you're yeah. able to do. I think this is a two way conversation. One is your advice is not only to you at the time, but also for a lot of leaders in the corporate world. Mm-hmm. Maybe every day, because everyone is blocks in some kind of framework, a lot of to do, step one, two, three, and five. Mm-hmm. Um, what can they learn from how to co create with the people you're working with? The That's other thing I wanted to ask is because people in their, even though they're like an amazing 22 year old, they still have their self doubt. It might not be easy for them to just voice out. What would you have done differently at the time for people to be able to express what they feel? Yeah. Well, I can kind of go back to like the slightly older than 22 version of, of myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, 
you know, I mentioned earlier, yeah, I was on the performance improvement plan, turned things around. Fortunately, I was able to turn things around. I was able to be a pretty solid performer um, at PNG. Towards the end of that role, you know, like I, again, like I wanted to get more involved in social causes. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about racial equity. And I was, and I was looking at that with respect to our, the, the manufacturing set I was working at. And felt like there was just real opportunity in terms of promoting racial equity in our hiring and then also in our leadership pipeline. Um, like I, for myself as a man of color, I didn't feel particularly seen. I know I was hearing that from some of the folks that I work with too, who are also people of color. Uh, and so I wanted to do something. Yeah. Um, I wasn't an organizer at that time. I wasn't an advocate. Like it would be years later that I started getting involved in politics and then like the work with Our Turn and, and such. Even when I was in Sheltering Arms in New York doing advocacy. So I don't really know all those different tips, but there were some things that um, that I did at the time that I feel like set me up pretty well mm -hmm. um, for engaging in a process of trying to drive change. Uh, I think the first thing was being actually being willing to listen. Ironically enough, I was just talking about that notion of humility and listening. So, yes. you know, I went and talked to different people, uh, you know, from my peers who were also leaders of color to even folks who were in hiring positions who maybe weren't people of color, just to understand a little bit more like what were the constraints, uh, like what were people actually experiencing in this work? Uh, and then in that process, what I started to do is I started to engage allies mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to think about like, what will it take for this to actually be effective? Like what I want to be able to do is to promote racial equity in our hiring. I want to expand the pipeline. I want the, our workspace to be one where when people color, of color come in, they feel embraced. How can I get this to a place where people take it seriously? Yeah. And so before I started putting pen to paper and stuff, I started asking people, especially senior leaders and some people who were actually already mentors to me in my career journey, and they gave me incredible advice. They said, all right, like, you could perhaps write something up. It could be directed to these different folks. Here's the information they're going to be looking for. Um, here's the tone to consider. And that wound up leading to a memo that I wrote up um, of several pages that I wound up delivering to our site's leadership. Um, and that was shortly before I transitioned from my role. And the feedback uh, was just incredibly receptive mm -hmm. and welcoming. Like, I think it was, like, people acknowledge it was tough for them to hear it. Yes. Right? Like, Oftentimes, that's, you know, that, that can be hard to be able to receive that type of like that type of push. But there was also a lot of gratitude, like real genuine gratitude, like, thank you for bringing this forward. Like, we want to be able to work on this. We want to be able to make changes. Um, and, and I think that happened because it really was a collective effort. Like, this wasn't me going out there trying to do it by myself. It was me leaning into a certain frustration that I had, hearing the stories of other people, um, finding allies, and then finding a productive way to be able to communicate something. Um, going forward and, and also like I offered myself up to just be part of the solution wherever I can I didn't want to just be like all right here I'm just going to drop this here and then y'all go do it but like however I can be supportive I'm here for it and I think people respond to that well too that it's not just a push but it's also an offer yeah yeah engage in the problem you want to solve and be right. a good listener and do right. something bigger than yourself Absolutely. I think that's what I take away from what Absolutely. you just said yeah. just now um, so that's a nice transition to what now because uh, when I listen to the podcast, the TED Talk, mm. uh, I thought you were still with our turn, but it seems like that's uh, in the past. But if you can share a little bit about, I think that's a continuous journey of what you wanted to do as an advocacy for um, diversify and yeah. equity. And well, I, I think it's interesting timing that we're coming right off of Climate Week. Yes. And Climate Week, of course, there are just so many inspirational, transformative ideas yes. right, that are shared. And, events and you know marketing campaigns and, and so on and you think about like why does it feel like we're still not quite moving the needle with respect to climate or you know almost name the issue right yeah and i don't think ideas are the problem we actually have incredible ideas like just you can just walk across this floor yeah. and we can get like remarkable transformative ideas from folks across a number of different issues so what is it that's holding us back well, what I believe is holding us back is that those folks who want to be able to drive those game-changing ideas, who hold them in their minds, in their hearts, in their souls, in their notebooks, wherever they are, uh, they are constrained. Like, they are constrained because they're operating within this construct that tells them either you can be successful and work really hard and hustle and scrap, and that's going to be an all-day process, or you can take care of your mind and your body and your soul and your heart. But you can't have both. <laughs> like you can't have both. Like it's not possible to have both. So what winds up happening? Well, as a result, our ideas never get very far. Because how far are you able to push that idea if you're on the brink of burnout? Yeah. Or yeah. if you're just disconnected altogether from your purpose because you're like, I'm well, I guess I'm just gonna meditate all day. 
and I just I guess I'm just gonna be on vacation. Yes, that can feel good for your body. Are you driving those transformative ideas though? No, you're not. So I think recognizing that like I've been trapped in that construct. Uh, other people I've worked with have been trapped there. What gave rise, uh, what came to, to you know up in my mind is this idea of harmonious leadership. Like, oh. What would it look like to break false choices so that people can harmonize their well-being and their performance to be able to drive uh, just their boldest impact ideas? Yeah, I need this. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think all of us do. Like, and you know, and look, I'm still calibrating on that too. But like, they're, they're, what I've discovered throughout my career is that there actually are mindsets and actions that you can take where your well-being and your performance are together as one, mm -hmm. and it amplifies, it it catalyzes, it punctuates those ideas that you have. So you can do truly incredible things while feeling your best and doing your best. Versus the conventional wisdom, which is that again. Like, all right, maybe you take a vacation for a week, but then you come right back into the grind. Uh, and uh, like, you're, you're, it doesn't change anything. Uh, and so like, I think we're at this place, yeah, this notion of change, where like, we need a vaccine. Uh, we don't just need like a quick vitamin or aspirin to yeah. solve a problem, like, yeah. we need a vaccine. I still have friends ask me, like, how do you actually push through the years outside? I, didn't, like, I was forced to make another choice, but now it ended up to become who I want to be as mm -hmm. my own current uh, common mm -hmm. financing idea, but I'm still very cautious about not being burned out. Oh, I would yeah. love to hear your version because you are you said that you're a recovering CEO. Yeah. And I also listened to your TED talk, you said that uh, somebody mentioned to you that you feel like you're having fun while mm -hmm. working. Right. It's surprising to me that maybe you have burned out as well. Oh you absolutely. If you can share. Oh yeah, you know, because I know very well what it's like to grind and to deal with scarcity uh, and not just for those external circumstances to, to be happening but to also carry that on myself and to feel like this must be some representation of who I am as a person and it's taken a lot of work and I haven't I wouldn't say like I've mastered this by any stretch um, but it's taken a lot of work to be able to observe these challenges as opposed to feeling like I am the challenge, like I am the reason why all these things are happening when we operate in a culture that's much bigger than ourselves, yeah. in these institutions that are much bigger than ourselves, like these are generational problems that we're working through. Mm -hmm. And and so yeah, like I experienced burnout deeply uh, with, with heightened anxiety and exhaustion and frustration and feeling isolated. And I had to like really look at that, um, you know, head on. And you know, through conversation with my wife and family and friends and, and therapy and meditation, mm -hmm. was able to get to this place where I could actually embrace these opportunities to be harmonious, which were actually right there in front of me. Yeah. Because the irony is that in many of those cases where I was experiencing burnout in my role, there were many cases where my team was actually flourishing. Like, like they were out there actually like embracing this idea that they can have well-being and performance. And meanwhile, I'm just on the performance side. I'm not thinking about well-being at all. Or I'm thinking about well-being from the standpoint of, again, like, let me just do a one-off vacation. Like, you know, these, like these little things without actually shifting, like, the energy that's mm -hmm. in me. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I, I've been on this journey of getting to that place of shifting that energy of recognizing, yeah, there actually is a healthier way for me to be able to lead. There's a healthier way for me to be able to live. And for that to be a daily process, you know, like we talked about that idea of being like 1% better every day. Yeah. Uh, and to like try and find those moments, find those opportunities to know that, yeah, there are going to be days that are still going to feel very heavy. Like they're going to feel challenging where I'm going to look in the mirror and, and feel like some sense of fear, you know, like there's going to be like some of that negative self-talk. Uh, but now that I think that I'm like, I've engaged in this work for like, for my betterment, I'm able to, um, to kind of like convert that energy in a way that's both healthier for me, but it's also healthier when I put it out into the world. And yeah, like that feels that feels fulfilling, you know, to be in that place where like this is not just like for me. I'm a part of something bigger. Yes. And so I yes. feel like that collective responsibility now. Yeah. Maybe it's helpful for folks if you can share like your typical Tuesday. How does it look like? Usually the first thing I'm doing is I'm waking up my son. <laughs> so I usually he's five. Um, so I'm, I'm usually waking up a little bit before he wakes up. Yeah. Um, I'm not a morning person. Like even now, having a son who's almost six, yeah. like you know, like I'm, I'm still a night guy. <laughs> so I'm usually waking up. I'm getting him up. Uh, I read him like a book or two in the morning, which feels like a nice space to be able to connect and to be able to ground a little bit. 
Um, like what I started doing recently is I'll start doing some positive affirmations in the morning mm -hmm. to you know just try and set like my my energy um, yeah. in, in the right place. You know, get breakfast together for him. Um, all the steps that are necessary to be able to get him out to school, and then I always go to the gym where I work out yes, like immediately yes. after. Like I'm like my body just needs it, it craves that. I also just love that process of just trying to get a little bit better. You know, like a, a little bit every day. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go to the gym, get back. Um, typically, like you know, we'll do like maybe like a quick meditation, get some breakfast, and then like then I'm fully off and running on my day. Um, at that point, like and and it could be any given day at that point can vary. Yeah. Um, so I can have a day with a lot of calls, um, you know, meetings, conversations with different people, you know, podcasts like this, yeah. maybe do a good talk, maybe do a workshop somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I'll try and like sprinkle in these different moments to be able to lift my energy and to be able to pace myself throughout the course of the day. That's something that I've learned over uh -huh. the past couple of years is that like you can't just be running marathons at a sprinter's pace nonstop, right? Like we're not built that way. You need to be able to find moments for rest and pause and recalibration sometimes every like hour out every one to two hours like you need to find that so i'm trying to get more disciplined um, throughout the course of the day and that could be as simple as like two minutes where i just walk up to my window and i just look at the trees yeah so just do that for two minutes um or i'll go and like see if like my my wife she works remotely too like does she have a few minutes just to be able to chat just to be able to, to catch up um uh, and then schedule those time? sometimes Sometimes, yeah, we'll be okay. Like, what are you doing at 12? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we do that. Uh, you know, like we just be, you know, talk in the kitchen or we might go for a walk, go outside yes, and go for a yes. walk. Um, and then, you know, my son will come home. Like, I'll usually be the one who goes and picks him up. Um, we'll hang out for a little bit. I'll typically do like a little bit more breath work at that time, like while he's having a snack in the afternoon. Um, then we'll hang out, you know, and I might have like a little bit of work here and there, like along the way, but like I really try to not have too much that's distracting me in the evening, like as much as possible. Might do a little bit more work while he's like having his bath in the evening. Again, like, you know, that's his time, that's cool. Like, or while he's watching videos, I'll do some stuff. Yeah. Um, tuck him in the evening. And then ideally there's not too much more work to be done at that point. Yeah. And so then um, watch something with my wife, you know, like watching only murders in the building right now. <laughs> or, or you know whatever else you know feels yeah, like all right yeah. like now we can just sort of like coast through the evening yeah. you know like and the usually the last thing i do before i go to bed is i'll um, do some gratitude journaling and write down mm -hmm. like, some of the things i'm grateful for from the day yeah so what i picked up was you have a really nice routine that actually keep you up at the well-being front mm -hmm. good um, I also interviewed another guy who's been on this podcast, but he has a book called Energize. Mm -hmm. He's also a life coach. He said that he schedule rest time. He said like instead of work-life yeah. balance, you use work-rest balance. Mm -hmm. I found it extremely useful I because love I yeah. schedule all my catch-up with my friends the same way I schedule everything. Mm -hmm. So throughout the day, I would, like this morning, I, I have some meetings about my startup. I have catch-up with a friend. And after this, um, and another podcast, I'm going to the gym. Then I catch up with them. Like I feel like if I don't schedule it, I would easily just right. work nonstop, right. and then I would feel horrible at the end. Well, it's a you know, and it's a. I think there's this reframing that we need to do to see rest as a necessary mm -hmm. gift, mm -hmm. um, and not a nice to have, and certainly not something that is a sign that something's wrong with us. Yes. Uh, we need this. Our our minds and bodies. We need it. Um, we're filling our own cups. Like we are. We are igniting that light within us. Um, it's what gives us more uh, more of that energy to be able to express our purpose in the world. And yeah, I've been someone who, like in, in looking at that notion of rest, yeah, at times it's felt like, oh, like is there something wrong with me? Like, why do I need to be resting so much? Like, yeah. why do I feel like I need to lay down? Why am I feeling like this buzz is too much? Like, that's all stuff that's like, that's the negative self-talk. Mm -hmm. um, and no, like our body's actually telling us like, hey, like, come back to me. Like, you know, take care of me. I'm here. I'm with you. I'm for you. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have to do something for me too. Uh, yeah. and, and like, and I think like we need to respond to that um, in, a, in a more loving way. Yeah, I think it's just very difficult. So it would be curious to see where you take the harmonious leadership to next. Because mm -hmm. sometimes as people who want to execute their ideas, most of the time they're type A personality. Like... Mm -hmm. I, I feel like sometimes even if I'm taking a break, I don't feel good. Like I was like guilty, you know, mm -hmm. because if I'm taking a break, 
especially back in the days, I don't have this understanding of racism necessary. Yeah. I'm like, I should have done more work. Mm. But now I know that it's counterintuitive. Sure. So it's harmonious leadership. I, I know that you're still ide it's in, in the idea stage and what kind of vision you have for it, mm -hmm. let's say, yeah. year forward. Yeah, well, my hope is that we can be able to shift consciousness around leadership. Uh, and shift the narratives out there that are so deeply entrenched in these hyper-masculine, white supremacist, capitalistic structures, which just tell you it's all about command and control. It's all about this top-down approach, like my way or the highway. Like, you know, you just need to be dragging people along. Like, that doesn't work. No. And the thing is, I don't know when it ever did, but it certainly is not working now. No. Um, you just look at all the evidence around us in terms of all the volatility that exists, all the disengagement of employees right now, just how desperate companies are and executives are for innovation, but they feel like they're not getting it. Well, yeah, it's because like, your people are rejecting your style of leadership. What do you expect? And so I want to see a, con a shift in consciousness. And I think a shift in consciousness for individual leaders, and that could be of any age, to feel like, wait a second, like I've been indoctrinated with something that doesn't serve me well, and it doesn't serve my ideas well. There is a better and healthier way to do this, and I hope that Harmony's leadership can be an accelerant for them. And then for organizations too, like also for those leaders who are engaging in that type of reflection to bring it back to their organization and change the way their organization operates. Mm -hmm. Because when we start seeing that happen, then we're going to see transformative change, right? All those ideas we're talking about from Climate Week, imagine if you had a more engaged workforce. Like imagine if you had a workforce that is more resilient, that is more purposeful, that is more connected. Like what would you go out and do? Like we would do remarkable revolutionary things. And like, and it's there for the taking. Like it's there for yeah. the taking because we all know that a change needs to happen. Like we just need the courage to just take the next step. And so I, I'm hoping that with what I'm doing, as a keynote speaker, as a coach, as a as a creator, like I'm making a film right now, for instance. Oh. Like these are all different things that can be like a spark for people. That's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You you are also very uh, artistic person. I think you can. Oh, thank you. You can put all of those together. I wanted to play your song. Yeah. Uh, the one that you have won multiple rewards. Um, uh, I'm dancing on the doorstep of history. Thank you. And I'm being changed. I wanted to ask a little bit about the music type yeah. side of things. Yeah. So when was that can come about the the album? So the last album I did released last year. Oh. Um, and I've been making music for a long time, so I'm something it's a part like, of who you are. It's a part of who I am. Like okay. I'm like six, seven albums in at this point. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on a new one as we speak. Oh. Uh, so I love it. It's absolutely a part of who I am. It, it, like hip hop has always been something that's helped me feel more connected, more energized, more expressive. Uh, it's brought me to places across the world that like I think wouldn't have been possible for me otherwise. Like I've performed at the World Economic Forum, at a prison, at the New York City Bar Association, like, at New York Poets Cafe. Like, I've, you know, I've been in a lot of places, that's the power of music, where music speaks to the soul. Like, it breaks down these different barriers and boundaries, and that's something that I benefited from, and it's something that I hope to be able to put out into the world more, too. That's so good. Um, the music, I noticed, is very relevant to what you used to do, or you're still doing the advocacy stuff. Mm -hmm. so the harmonious leadership is more leaning towards to um, helping the leaders in organizations, but not really, do you have a focus on what kind of leaders? Or um, Honestly, I think just about anybody, but I think especially people who have some uh, desire to be advancing social impact. Okay. So that may not be entirely your job. You, you don't have to be working in nonprofit, you don't have to be working in like corporate philanthropy, for example. But if you think about it, two thirds of Gen Z and millennials are um, expecting their companies to prioritize social purpose. Mm -hmm. So that that is beyond critical mass. That is the majority of people who want to be able to see purpose happening in their own lives and in their workplace. So I think that there's like this massive opportunity, I think, for people to be able to lean into what purpose can do for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and like how, how can you express purpose if you don't have well-being? Right? How can you do that if you feel like you're not actually making a difference, if you feel like you're not actually performing? Um, and so that's why I hope like through, you know, like through my music or through harmonious leadership, whatever it might be doing, like, you know, helping folks to be able to take that step. Yeah, when you envision there's going to be some kind of like workshop, uh, 
retreat. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, That's my guess. Yeah. 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 When can we see that on your side? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, things will be coming out like in the coming weeks and months. Um, <laughs> so probably like the next big things is film that I'm mentioning. So yeah, you know, yeah. stay tuned on that. You know, this is something I've been working on for about a year and a half. And I'm excited mm-hmm. to get it out there into the world. Um, you know, there's also some workshop ideas and some community ideas that, that are sort of like percolating in my mind right now. So that might be like the 2025 thing. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to it, especially now you have this uh, platform like TED is promoting you. Mm. I listen to TED Talks daily and then you're also on TED Talk business mm. again. Uh, so looking forward to seeing right. more of your impact. So, well, if, you. Are you allowed to say anything about the, uh, the movie? Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the film is called In Pursuit Of. Uh, and it's centered on my late father, uh, and and it started as um, as an effort to be able to uplift and memorialize his incredible story, and for me and my family to be able to learn more about like just who he was. We went back to his uh, his birthplace in Sri Lanka. We walked in his footsteps through his village, through his school, but it really grew uh, over time as I was developing it. As I started sharing the concept with different people into something that's actually this narrative about a reimagination of not just leadership but the American dream. Uh, because my dad had this very uh, unconventional path to achieving the American dream of being successful. He did it through service. Uh, you know, first off, like it wasn't engineering or business or anything like that. He did it through service, but then also, and it's similar to my mom, my mom's a teacher, but also my dad had massive sacrifice along the way. Yeah. Uh, he dealt with a lot of scarcity. He kept, he kept, you know, I've been talking a lot about this notion of like this baggage within us. He kept a lot of that on him. Mm-hmm. And he just wasn't able to really soak in everything that he achieved in his life. And so the film, I think it raises these questions for people when they watch it about like, oh, like how could I be able to pursue greatness but in a healthier way? Like how could I achieve peace in this process of pursuing greatness? Uh, are there different nonlinear ways to achieve the American dream? Uh, so yeah, like I, I'm just excited, I think for, you know, it's a documentary short, um, it's, it's received some awards already from some film festivals, which has been wonderful, and I'm just excited to like, get it out there to people, and hopefully it sparks in that reimagination yeah, that that's I think amazing. people are looking for. Yeah, I think we all need that. There's a question I forgot to ask earlier, because mm-hmm. we talked about your South Asian, Asian descent. It's, the other day I was talking to a friend of mine, he's like, do you notice that people who are not from here, like at least you're not the the second generation or third generation of immigrants, it's very difficult for us to push back, in mm-hmm. the, especially in the traditional hierarchical yeah. um, white dominant uh, corporate environment. Mm-hmm. How would you help these people to get across, like get across the box that we put ourselves in mm-hmm. for ourselves? Actually, no one is putting this box on us, right? Because we can step outside of it to actually voice for us, voice out for ourselves. Mm-hmm. I think I got a lot better now. I need to. I owe it to my mentor. He's also Chinese, but he's like spent thirty years in in New York. He always pushes me. He he almost provided this safe environment for me mm-hmm. to push back, so I got comfortable doing that. But I really want to have something that I can share with people who are similar mm-hmm. to our background sure. and young and right. not sure about themselves. Right. Yeah, yeah well, I, I, I feel like you're going to answer the question. I think so much of it comes down to allyship. Yeah. I think we're taught that you need to do everything individually. Like it all comes down to your individual force of will, your own ambition, like your own sense of self. And yes, that's all important. But like as humans, like we, we need community. We need connection. We thrive on that. What I would encourage folks to do is to try to find your allies. Mm. Who are those people like your mentor who are going to cheer you on? Mm. Like who are going to push you, who see that that you are great and that there is beauty and perfection in you and that deserves to shine and get out there in the world and surround yourself with those people. Yeah. And so if you know who those people are, be around them more often, <laughs> right? Like fill your cup. It's okay if someone heaps compliments on you, receive it. Yes. Like don't push it back, receive it. Keep yeah. it for yourself. If you're struggling to find those people, ask questions. Mm-hmm. Like I think, you know, if you go out and ask questions like of people who are around you, like maybe something you're curious about, to ask them like, what are those things that light you up? Like, what are you passionate about? What are the things that you wish you knew? What advice do you have for me? Chances are you're going to discover an ally in that process. It may not be that first person you talk to, or the second, maybe it's the fifth, maybe it's the tenth. But if you just have inquiry and curiosity, you're going to find your allies, mm-hmm. and that is what's going to open things up for you. Because then those people, are they're going to see it in you. Even if you don't see it for yourself or if you're too scared to, like they're going to be the ones who are going to say, yes, go and do that thing. That thing that you're scared about, 
go and do it. Here's why you should do it and why the world needs it. Yeah. Uh, and better to listen to that than like some um, other advice out there that's suppressing you. Like, yeah. how does that serve you? Yeah. You know, listening to something else that's like, no, actually, you should stay within this lane. That doesn't serve you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I think that's exactly why we're having these conversations because sometimes it might be difficult if we surround ourselves all with the same people. Mm. Like, we're, uh, I grew up very good at negative self talk. Mm. Self talk, right? I was sure. like, I'm not good enough, I'm not as smart enough, all that kind of stuff. But, and then I break through that box and listen to other people and learn that I actually am enough. I have tried everything I can to be where I am. Absolutely. Um, it's just a, a younger version of mine. I wish I could mm. know that as well. But it's a journey. And the question for what next? I wish, I would love us to do an imaginary time travel mm. to 2040. Like okay. Your son is six now. At the time, he will be 21. Yeah, yeah, 21, 22. 21, yeah. 22. Okay. What <laughs> would you want your son, your 22 year old son, to say about you oh. at the year 21? Uh, I would want him to say the same things that I would hope he would say right now. What's that? Uh, which is that uh, I'm full of love mm -hmm. and joy and curiosity and adventure and and I'm here to ensure that for him there is as much safety and security as possible so that he can flourish uh, and I'm here to be his biggest cheerleader in that journey and it is his journey it's not mine um, I hope that would be the same thing that right. he would say in in 2040 and I think all of those characteristics that um, I try to bring into our family life, and for him, those are the same characteristics that I aspire to bring into the world. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea what I'll be doing from a professional standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know where I'm going to be living, or even my wife and I, where we're going to be living. Um, I just know I want to be able to live with uh, love and, and gratitude and generosity, and the rest will sort out. And curiosity and the rest will sort out. That's amazing. So, yeah. still stay in 2040, and mm -hmm. your son is becoming a young leader. Yeah. What kind of advice you give it to him? Honestly, he, he's going to be giving me advice. <laughs> I think he's going to be giving me advice. He's, he already is. He already is. I don't know what I'm going to be telling him at that point, right? But I think at that point, like really the name of the game for me is like, wherever he or you know his peers, people who are coming into their own at that point, like wherever they might be needing support or door to be open, I hope I'm in a position to do that. You know, I've been like telling people a lot recently that like I'm in a mode now where like, Less and less do I want to be the king, more I want to be the king maker. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. I want to be the one who is getting people on the platforms they deserve, like the stages that they deserve, uh, so they can go out and do incredible things. Like that's like that's how I'm trying to operate as much as I can right now. And I think certainly by 2040, like I don't know where I'm gonna be with respect to the spotlight, but like it's it's yeah, I think I think it's about like, all right, what can I learn from you, yeah. and how can I help you? What kind of advice your son has been giving to you now? Oh man, the um, best one. The, the the best ones. Um, a lot of times, it's around sort of just like take it easy. Do, do like, you need to say okay. that like out loud? Yeah, he does. Like you know, it could be something as small as like we're going into the city and I'm trying to get on a, onto a certain ferry. I'm like, all right, hey, like his name is Lucian. Mission. All right, here's what we're gonna do. Like, we gotta hop in the car. We gotta move quickly. Like, once we get there, we have to park. I'm going through all these steps, and he's like, oh, but it's okay. Like, if we miss that one, we'll just take the next one. And I'm like, wow, yeah. what a mature. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you're, 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 you're right. Like, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes he's talking to me about communication clarity. <laughs> like, you know, like. It's, it could it could vary, but I feel like oftentimes I, mean, I think he, clearly he can pick up on my energy and recognize that yeah, oftentimes all I just need to do is just take a breath. The future generation just take a breath. Uh, keeps you grounded. Oh yeah, very much so. keeps keeps me grounded. It keeps me focused on like what truly matters and um, to just be able to live with the greatest sense of just joy in every moment because I think that's what kids are able to do. Yeah. Right. That's what naturally comes to them. For us, we've got all sorts of stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah, so that, yeah, yeah. That it kind of gets in the way. Um, kids bring us back to where we want to be. Yeah, and that's what the future is that we want to work for. Them. Yeah, that's all. Well. Yeah, I mean, I heard somebody say the other day that like when I grow up, I want to be the five-year-old uh, version of myself. 
Yes, I, like, I heard it somewhere. Yeah, like, like that makes so much sense. I want to be the one who my five year old self and my 85 year old self will be both proud. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. thought it somewhere. Yeah. Let's do a lightning round. Okay. Are you ready? Sure, let's do it. Yeah. Team Taylor or Team Beyonce? Oh man, see, I can't contradict myself on my <laughs> TED talk, right? Of like, you know, the false, the false choice. Um, I prefer Beyonce's music. Okay. But I'm not throwing shade at Taylor Swift or her community. Yeah. I went to a soul cycle the other day. It's okay. Beyonce slash Taylor Swift. Nice. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's amazing. Favorite leadership advice in the past you've received that now you reject? I don't know if I can put like exact words to it, but I think just anything along the lines of like you as a leader set the tone for and control everything. Oh, like okay. I've heard that in many different forms. Yeah. And I used to believe that was true. Okay. Um, in studying different alpha males. But yeah. Like, but no, it is not true. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Dream collaboration, musical, professional. Ooh, dream collaboration, musical or professional. Musical. <laughs> you know, my son's getting into uh, a lot. He's into a lot of different types of music. He's getting really into like One Republic recently. Oh. So that, I'll say One Republic okay. for the satisfaction of my son. But I love One Republic too. Okay. Um, professional, a dream professional collaboration. I'd say LeBron James. LeBron James. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, one song you could listen to on repeat forever. Mm. Oh, there's so many. There's there so one. there's so many. To pop me against the world. <laughs> ah, this one. That's it. Okay, I'll put it on my list. Cool. <laughs> this. Yeah. Um, and then, best and worst career advice. Best and worst career advice. Yeah. Um, You've received. So best advice is a friend of mine. You know, we were talking about music. Oh. Um, Early in my career, he was also a music maker too. I was like, you know, hey, like I don't know, I'm like struggling with my work right now. I want to do more of this music thing. I have no idea what to do. And he said, all right, when it comes to music, do you believe that if you worked really hard at it, that you could be very good at it? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. He said, but that's all you need to know. And that advice, I feel like, doesn't only pertain to music. It could pertain. To, it has pertained to so many things in my life where like my compass is just driven by improvement, improvement and growth and expansion and abundance. And so that can be pertaining to any job. Mm -hmm. um, if I see that opportunity for growth and yeah. curiosity, like that's where I want to be. That's what I want to be doing. Um, the worst advice, oh boy. I, I mean, I think it's anything that's been like the opposite. It's been anything that's constraining. Yeah. Like anything that tells me like, Oh, you can only do this one thing. Oh, yeah. Like even like even yeah. recently, for example, it's like you know I've been talking about this idea of harmonious leadership, infusing well-being and performance. And I talked to some folks who were very well intentioned. Yeah. But they said, yeah, like I feel like you're kind of talking about like burnout. You're also kind of talking about social impact. I think you need to pick one or the other. I said no, I'm not going to. No. Like the point is to not have to make those choices. Like mm -hmm. they are connected. They're fused. And the problem is that we are asked to make those choices. So. Like, is that the worst advice? I mean, it, it's coming from a good place. I get it. Yeah. It to be successful, but yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't enjoy it for me. The closing tradition is you have a question from a previous guest mm -hmm. and you leave one for the next guest. So the okay. question from the previous guest is what brings you alive? Mm. Being in the outdoors with my wife and son. Nice. Yeah, being in the outdoors in any form. Um, Close to the nature. Close to nature. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly I mean, that's precisely what I want to do today. Yeah. yeah. When I when I get back home. Yeah. Um, question from the next for a, the next. A question for the next guest. Um, what is a song that you would want to be played every time you walk into a room? Oh wow, it's a great question. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. This is Mohan Siva Loganathan. Mohan Siva Loganathan. Siva Loganathan. Oh, Noha Siva Logan. Mohan Siva Logan Nathan. Mohan Siva Logan Nathan. Yes. Mohan Siva Logan Nathan. Yes. Thank you so much right. for being on the Thank show. You. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure.